Hey guys, this is James from Man Tripping. We are here at another Men Who Blog virtual happy hour. And uh, I'm really excited about this one because I love wine. And I know a lot of you guys do too. But I know an equal number of you guys love your women and love your wives and partners. And sometimes get dragged to wine tastings going like, oh my God, a wine tasting? Seriously, I'd rather be at a distillery or a brewery. Guess what, guys? The wine industry has lots and lots of stuff for guys and lots and lots of awesome stuff to talk about. It can be a little bit daunting, but don't worry. Don't let anybody tell you that a wine tasting has to be snooty and, and boring and you know academic because it's about drinking wine, enjoying some beautiful places. And uh, one of my favorite places to visit is Oregon, not only because it's beautiful, not only because the weather is fantastic and much nicer and cooler than it is here in San Diego right now at about 80, 85, 90 degrees, but they have amazing wine too. So luckily today we have the guys from Bell's Up Winery. They sent us three. This is the Titan Pinot Noir, the Firebird Syrah, and this one I'm really looking forward to. It is a, uh, we well, can't really see it in the lighting glare, but it is a rosé of Pinot Noir. And uh, again, for those of you guys, we love challenging pre preconceptions because rosé is marketed as a women's drink here in the U.S. And that's complete BS. Around the world, Pinot or uh, rosé is definitely enjoyed by all genders. It's simply an easy drinking uh, wine that is great on a hot summer day. So we'll talk more about that, but instead of me getting all geeky and nerdy about different kinds of wine, let's kick it over to the impresario of, of wine and bars and all things pub club related, Kevin, our co-host. How's it going, Kevin? Uh, are you auditioning to be my PR guy? I'm your, I'm your hype man. <laughs> uh, we'll work something out. We'll work something out here. Coming to you from warm San Diego, just around the corner from Shane. I'm Kevin Wilkerson of PuzzLove.com. The website about anywhere in the world you can have a pinch in your hand. And I have so many classes of wine here from Shells Up that I uh, have more uh, wine glasses than I have hands. So that's great. I do apologize if I have to suddenly leap up out of this chair and go answer my door because we are expecting uh, delivery for wines for a special tasting we're doing tomorrow. Uh, the guy was supposed to be here at 10 o'clock and it's 1.30 and he's not here yet. So I apologize in advance if I suddenly leap up and disappear for a minute or so. Uh, we're thrilled to have Bells Up Winery. I spent a lot of time in uh, Portland in the area in my uh, sports car and any car public relations days. So I've been up there many times. I haven't been by where their winery is, but I've been down to Salem, he said about, about an hour from Salem. I've been to Portland a lot. I even did a wine tasting on the Oregon coast one time when I just went up uh, kind of on my own to uh, have a weekend with a lovely uh, Portland lady that I had met at one, at one of the races. So I'm anxious to uh, try all these wines. I'm particularly anxious. I've been wanting this rosé the last two days because it's been about 90 degrees here along the coast of San Diego. And a rosé is going to be a great, great uh, wine to try today on this really hot, hot day here in Southern California. And then I'll, I guess we'll toss it over to uh, Pub Club at Ashley. Hey, Ashley. Look at that. Look, I love your setup there. That's beautiful. Thank you. I copied you, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> I'm really excited about this uh, virtual wine tasting. I'm hoping that um, some people um, will be able to do it with us. And if not, they will be interested in trying it after this. I'm very excited. And then last but certainly not least, Dave Spector who I understand is not only a expert winemaker, but is also a, uh, a reformed uh, um, uh, French horn player? <laughs> well, I, I don't think he ever totally stopped playing, but uh, in, in my case, once I, I, I played for 20 years, I, I loved playing it. I had so many amazing experiences from playing, but once I kind of got a real job and started having to make actual money and Started having a little less time to practice, and next thing you know, my horn's been sitting out in the case for about 10 years, and I keep thinking, maybe, maybe someday I'll be able to get back around to it, but uh, for now, it's kind of where it belongs. You wouldn't want to hear me playing it these days. I am so <laughs> out of practice. Well, well uh, Dave, I've got my horn here, actually. Uh, awesome. <laughs> so when we do the horns up, I'm going to do a, a horns up. Uh, and I actually do play the saxophone when I have a summer March 6th, which is the greatest saxophone ever made. Like yours, it's sitting in a closet uh, 
Mine's in a friend's house in uh, Hermosa Beach. <laughs> but I found the place. I can do the horns up when you're ready to do the face up. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about kind of how you guys got started. I understand that, you know, we talked a little bit about the fact that there's a huge spectrum of, of wineries. Obviously, there, there's some big names that everybody knows, but uh, I really like finding the, the small gems where you can you can walk up and you say, you know, oh, so are you uh, are you the winemaker? The person goes, well, absolutely, as opposed to the person being, no, I'm just an hourly employee that can't wait to get a shift done. <laughs> and, uh, exactly. And, and you know what, what you're saying, James, is exactly, you know, when we started talking about how to do this winery, this, that's exactly what we wanted to be. Um, when my wife and I, Sarah, when my wife Sarah and I started making wine, this was almost 15 years ago, uh, back when we were living in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I was at the time still a practicing attorney, and this was when we started out, we thought it was just the hobby, and that's what it was for many, many years. Um, but then the more we got into it, the more we realized, you know, we'd much rather be doing this than being attorneys, uh, or I'm sorry, I, for me being an attorney. Um, but the places that we always loved visiting when we traveled were, the, as you said, it's the smaller places, not even necessarily places where you had to call and make an appointment, but, but places where when you went in, you would have the ability to talk to the owner and the winemaker. And you could just take that time and not worry about being in a crowded tasting room where everything looks like it belongs in some Italian villa somewhere. If we just wanted something that was more relaxed. Um, you know, what you see behind me here is our barrel room. Um, this is also where we do the tastings in bad weather. And, and as you can see, there is not much to it. I mean, our, our facility is a converted pole barn that was already on the property when we found it. We just converted it to this purpose. So, you know, the thing about wine tasting, guys, is it does not need to be, you know, something that has so much pomp and circumstance around it. You know, for us, We've always said that, you know, when you go to Europe, for example, and you see how wines are tasted there, they're all family made, mostly in people's basements or at local co-ops. And there's just not the show to it that we like to put on in the U.S. So trying to find places like that, which, you know, they're, they're out there um, and plenty to see. Uh, but find places like that where you can just kind of relax and, and then just ask questions. I mean, that's when we started on our own wine journey, this is how we learned. We went to a lot of places. We asked a lot of people a lot of questions. And then we actually listened to them when, you know, they talked to us. And, I, you know, when you're getting started or even, you know, if, if you're into it for a little while, that's the most important thing. Awesome. Well, you know what? I would love talking, just talking forever and ever, but I have a big mouth. But my mouth enjoys actually drinking the wines as well. They're sitting here in front of me. Uh, you know, I got only two hands, so I can only lift two at a time. But it, it smells wonderful. No, and, uh, it smells great. They're right in front of my, uh, my nose here, and they smell really good. James was pouring them just before the show, and that, that pouring sound of them just sounded so cool as well. Well, thank you. That's kind of one of the things we, we try, you know, when, I love it when you, you know, when you were talking about the people of our winery, it's just basically me and my wife. I mean, that's it. We have some volunteers that help us around harvest, but, you know, it's pretty much as mom and pop an operation as it gets on a daily basis with us. And one of the things that we said we wanted all of our wines to be is, you know, yummy. You know, we, you can read so much about wine and you can talk about, oh my gosh, any bizarre fruit that's probably three people in the world have ever tried in their lives. And you can get as pretentious as you want about this. But, you know, for me, it's how does it smell? Does it smell like I really want to drink it? Okay, that's good step one. Then two, what does it taste like? You know, you don't need to psychoanalyze the thing. Just kind of say, hey, does this hit me in the right way? Yep. All right, we're there. I mean, you know, don't overcomplicate it beyond the way it, the way it has to be. And, and you know, that that's something that even people who have, like myself, that got – to be honest, I got started in, in with my love of wine in Michigan. And people mm -hmm. in California go, Michigan wine? Ah. But the reality is, like, it was good. I enjoyed it. And, uh, and, and now I've, I've grown uh, you know, from there. I still enjoy it. Uh, cool. But the, the, the challenge, I think, too, is, is remembering to, to knock yourself down a few pegs. That you know, now I can sit there and go, oh, with, with notes of kumquat and da 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 da. <laughs> and what, what, what AVA is this from? And, and, and that's all important. And, and uh, not to diminish you know, the, the sophistication, but I, I love the fact that it's a hobby and a passion that 
can grow as far as you want. Like if you want to get down into the nerdiness of the acidity of the soils, uh, that's cool. But if you want to just say, you know what, this rosé smells like I want to drink it, <laughs> then then that's good too. Hey, so that's so fun. with that being said, let's uh, and let's kick it off and, and start tasting. Yeah. So let me tell you a little bit about the wine while y'all are tasting it. So um, what you have, this is our prelude. And this is, uh, as James is saying, this is our rosé. This is made from Pinot Noir grapes. I think one of the important things to understand about rosé itself is all it is is a style. It's not a grape. It's not, there are a million ways to make a rosé. And what you're essentially trying to do is get a pink colored wine that is lighter and got a lot of fruitiness to it. What I love about the way we do it is we don't require you to turn in your man card just because you're drinking a pink wine. Um, we have, you know, we've all, we have a lot of rosés out here in Oregon. A lot of them are very pale. Oh, hello. hello. That's Abby. <laughs> a lot of them are very pale. A lot of them are very, very light. And the only problem with that is you spend a lot of time not being able to really taste the wines, especially when it's really, really cold. So I wanted to make a rosé that was a little bigger and a little bolder and you know, something you could kind of have with a cheeseburger if you wanted to and still be able to taste the wines. This is really, really nice. It, it, the acid, I like the fact that it's still got some acidity because too many rosés, I think, are these mass market, uh, you know, $5 bottle, $10 bottle rosés, which it has, has a place. But I like the fact that this still has some acidity so that you can enjoy it to your point with a cheeseburger or some actual food as opposed to just getting drunk. Exactly. Exactly. And it's it's got the it's got the fruitiness to it without being sweet. And that's you know one of the very few trigger words I think we have in the wine industry is that word sweet because it can mean two very very different things. One of which and, and it's particularly relevant to a wine like a rosé. One sweet means literally sugary sweet. And when we think about the way pink wine was done in this country as as soon as like maybe seven eight years ago. When you saw pink wine, you would almost automatically assume that it was going to be sugary sweet. And a lot of people that were very, very young and very, very old love to drink those wines, but not a lot of folks in the middle. Um, but there is the second type of sweet, which is, comes from the fruitiness of what you taste. And that will trick your tongue into thinking that there is actually sugar in the wine when it's dry as a bone. If you sat there and ran lab tests on it, you'd find hey, that there's really no sugar in here at all. It's just fermented grape juice, but it's got these chemical compounds in it that are gonna trick your tongue into thinking that you've got this fruitiness to it. Um, when, yeah, that's all it's doing. It's just giving you lots of great fruit flavor. Well, this is not uh, sugary at all. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> Bless you, Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do want to say that there was a time you, you mentioned like Manly and Rosés. Uh, I actually did an article one time um, about how my seen girls never to go out with a guy that drinks Rosé because he couldn't make up his mind. Girls like that guy do the same. And I had mentioned this kind of laughing. Uh, I was on a first trip to uh, Carmel, who we were at one of the wineries, and um, I got educated that I was wrong on that. That uh, it might have been that way in the past, but now people, particularly in France, drink a lot of rosés on a really, really hot day. So instead of myself, that would normally drink a cold beer, uh, mm -hmm. kitty, then uh, the rosés are quite acceptable to drink as far as. Uh, uh, you know, wines go on a hot day, and it's you know, okay if a guy orders a rosé. I suppose only on a hot day, maybe. What do you think, girls? If he orders it on the dinner table, I don't know. And, and uh, I probably you guys get tired of me telling the story, but <laughs> I I didn't quite understand rosés until I was in Sonoma. I don't know. Do you know? Uh, I can't remember his name right now, but do you know uh, Longboard Vineyards? It's mm -hmm. a uh, great. Anyhow, th this guy. Is probably one of the most manly men you're going to find. He's a uh, international surfer. He is a uh, a Israeli uh, army uh, officer, maybe. Uh, cool. Nobody would ever tell this guy that he was anything but a manly man. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he loves rosés. And he said, "Hey, he said, you know what? When I go surfing, I go to places like the coast of France. I go to the coast of, of uh, Spain. I go to places like Chile. And 
we all drink rosé on the beach. And I'm like, okay, you know what? If this guy is telling me that surfers have 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 the right and and the the love for for rosé after going surfing, then gosh darn it, you know, a, a guy like me that's sitting in his office can enjoy some rosé too with uh, with his permission. So, you know, for all of you guys who think otherwise, uh, try this. Uh, the Prelude one, and you can buy that on. I wish it wasn't. My glare wasn't so bad, but uh, anyhow, we'll just the other labels show up better. But anyhow, you go to bellsupwinery.com dot com and, and you ship anywhere uh, anywhere that the states allow. Is that right? Exactly. Utah and Kentucky are the only two places that cause us problems. We can get it anywhere else. Wow, cool. So uh, that's a really pretty glass there, Gabby. It is fancy. I think I got it at Big Lot. <laughs> <laughs> I guess That's okay because I, I, I got this at, at a at a taste at uh, Shady Lane Cellars, which I'm not sure where that is, and I got <laughs> these other ones at uh, the Wine and Food Fest. So, if you ever get if you ever get a chance, I don't know what it, what they charge to be a part of it, but the uh, San Diego Bay Food and Wine Festival is absolutely fantastic, and they do a lot of great educational events too. So, anyhow. So uh, you want to move on to? Uh... Well, let's ask him first of all. Can you give us a little, uh, you know, brief uh, you know, history of the winery and also where the name comes from? I think I, I think I might have said one earlier, but it's actually well done. Can you uh, give us a little rundown of the winery? Oh yeah, sure. So kind of everything starts. You know, we kind of talked a little bit about having the French horn on on the logo here. I'm really but that's sort of where everything started. Um, when we decided, you know, very early on, one of the very first questions you have to answer when you start up a small winery is, how are you going to brand? And I think well, for a lot of folks, they say, oh, well, we're just going to make it easy. We're just going to slap our own names on it and go with that or name it after our dog or our daughter. Or and we just, we kind of got a little tired of the conventions and we wanted to do something a little different, but we still wanted to make it personal. So, you know, kind of starting with the music theme gave us the opportunity to do some fun things additionally. So, for example, as we, as we talked a minute ago, the rosé is called the Prelude, um, and every one of our wines is named for a piece of music that has a lot of really great French horn parts, um, most of which I played, some of which I wish I'd played better, but you know, that's kind of how it goes. Um, but anyway, so we kind of had the theme and we were able to start running that down and we got to a point where we said, all right, we have everything set up except for the name. And we wanted to find the property first and then tie something about the property in with the theme. And we got really lucky because we ended up with a piece of property on Bell Road. And um, yeah, so everybody likes to say, oh, did they name the road after you? Or, or said, no, 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 we're not, we're not that special. But um, so... <laughs> There, there was a very, very easy tie-in. Um, for a French horn player, Bells Up refers to a particular moment in music. It happens very seldom, but every once in a while, the composer wants to add a little dramatic flourish in the music. And so when you have this, what we call the Bells Up moment, and there will be a little notation that says Bells Up in the score, and as, you know, as you're playing the instrument, you're seated and you lift the bell of the instrument up. And if you're really smart, you kind of work in a little tilt toward the crowd. So you can kind of start shooting the sound out that way. And yeah. it's, there you go. There you go. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of that moment where you get to be the star of the show. I mean, most of the time as a, as a horn player, we're kind of in the mellow middle of everything. But every so often, you got to take your chances when you can get them. And uh, so it, ju it just seemed to be perfect, um, not only to bring in the road, but it had some additional advantages. Um, it was short. It was very easily pronounceable. And it's close enough to the front of the alphabet to where we're going to show up near the top of alphabetical <laughs> lists. But it doesn't make us look desperate. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you have to get a few breaks along the way if you're going to be successful with something like this, no matter how hard you work. So, yeah, we, we got a little lucky to be able to land in a spot that just kind of played right into it. Cool. And, and then you guys have, obviously, a, a tasting room, and, and you also do the shipping. Uh, uh, so where are you, sorry, you probably said this, but where are you guys located and how, uh, how can people get there? 
Yeah, so we're located in Newburgh, Oregon, um, which is about 25 miles southwest of Portland, uh, right in the heart of the Willamette Valley. Um, we've got uh, all sorts of wonderful uh, B&Bs, and uh, there, we've got a five-star resort and a bunch of other wineries around us. But you know what's great about this area is you're not far from anything. You know, I mean, that's why a lot of people are coming to the valley as a destination location, because... If you want to go spend a day up in Portland, you can do that. If you want to spend a day out on the coast, you're, it's about an hour and a half away. You can do that. Wineries, restaurants, of course. Um, the hiking in the mountains and uh, and waterfalls. I mean, this is just an amazing area to be able to do that. Um, and so, yeah, we're we're located. Uh, yeah, so it's and, and we're one of the one of the first places that you hit as you kind of descend into the valley. Uh, so it's it's not like it's going to take you forever to reach us if you're coming up from Portland. Um, but yeah, I mean, and this is the only place where you can get our wines. We don't sell in stores. We don't sell in restaurants. Our whole thing about the way we wanted to do business was to make it very personal and to get to know all of our customers. I mean, one thing we can say is that we've met every person that we've sold wine to. Um, and that can be by phone, that can be by email, but you're going to have to have some sort of a conversation with us because, you know, we want to get to know you and, and know the right wines for you. and. You know, I think it just makes it a lot more fun of an experience overall when you get to say, hey, I got to talk to the person who did all this stuff. I completely agree. I, I think, for, I mean, the reality is today, America, the American wine industry, there's phenomenal wines everywhere. We're, we're talking a little bit about uh, Yadkin Valley, which it, mm-hmm. you know, is not a great, a great wine area for North Carolina, but not they, they don't have the same soils and the same climate that the Pacific Northwest does. But you know what? I would rather go into a, a small winery there where you can talk to the guy and learn and you know what he, what he or she uh, you know loves and, and, and is trying uh, because that's uh, you know a way that I can remember go like hey you know what I'm sipping this thinking of a great vacation memory mm-hmm. and uh, we get some comments so uh, the Carolee apparently there, there's no shipping to Kentucky yet. But uh, Kentucky, fall. you guys are. Fall. We should be able to do it in the fall. Oh, okay. Well, that that's good news. Break, breaking news here. Uh, <laughs> you heard it here you first. <laughs> and yeah, then, uh, alcohol laws are always fun to deal with. Apparently, Carolee's a, a fan of of your wife as well. Uh, I, yeah, I think I think she's a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Gabby, as a bartender, you're familiar with the wines in the uh, in that area, right? Can you? about their experience yeah um i actually that's i think william the valley is when i started drinking pinot noirs uh i just like how jammy and light they are i forgot the ones i originally had but i did like a wine tasting there and i stayed at mc mcmenamin mcmenamin oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a famous hotel in oregon there's like a few of them mm-hmm. and they, I think they take like old buildings and they turn, they turn them into like resorts and there's like little speakeasies and like hidden rooms in there and they're so cool. But I stayed there and then we went to wine tasting in Willamette Valley and I swear like every one that I had there is just so good. I don't know if it's like the water or the soil or like the grapes or how they make it, but the wine there is just, especially their pinots, just because they're really light and they're jammy and like. I just taste like there's they're not as acidic as other Pinot Noirs I had, which I which I really love. So, yeah, I love it. I, this, this wine is amazing too. I love it already. This is great. I'm tasting the rosé. Yeah, awesome. Well, I think a lot of it is for for our area. You know, we we understand what we do well here. Um, you know, with with so much of, of any wine area, it is what can what grapes will grow and ripen best in any one spot. And in the Lamet Valley, we're in a cooler, wetter climate, and we don't have a long growing season the way they do in California or up in central or eastern Washington. So we have to grow the grapes that work best in that climate, and that is a lot of whites. Pinot Noir, um, and there are a few others that are a little more obscure, but that are kind of fun to deal with too. And then we've got we've got some more experimental stuff that's going on. So it's it's a fun fun area to be in um, because you have a lot of smaller places. I mean, we don't have any. We just don't have like the big corporate places the way they do in California. Um, so you know, it really gives the opportunity for people to try things and see how they work. And you know, we find something fun, and we we uh, you know 
put it in as, as necessary. So what are some of the experimental things you're doing? I'm, I'm always a big fan of experiment. I just had a, a dry hopped uh, Sauvignon Blanc the other night, and that was, uh, Ooh, it was a, a really interesting experiment. I, I, I don't know that I would buy a case of it, but I would, I would absolutely, uh, you know, buy a glass of it if I went back to uh, the winery. Yeah, well, I think what really comes down to is we're starting to try to find some more obscure grapes that will grow well in the environment that we have um, and really start to be able to offer some folks some opportunities to try some things that, you know, might just they may just never get anywhere. And one of the examples of that is actually for what we do is a wine. Um, that we're not going to be tasting today, but if anybody, if any of your listeners are going to come to the tasting room, we'd love to pour them some. It's a grape called Seval Blanc, uh, spelled S-E-Y-B-A-L. Um, we have uh, our brand name for that is called Helios. And that's a grape that you find primarily in the Midwest and on the East Coast. And it's a grape that was, it's called a hybrid grape, and it was bred at Cornell um, up in New York. And you see these grapes develop because if you're trying to grow in areas where you have really harsh winters, the traditional French varietals, Pinot Noir, Syrah, Merlot, and so on and so forth, just aren't going to survive when you get temperatures down to minus 5, minus 10. Um, and so having grapes that can survive those temperatures you know, allows you to be able to grow grapes in these areas and make really, really great wine, you know, without doing kind of the traditional French styles. Um, and of course, anytime you hybridize anything, you're going to end up with kind of a very unique flavor profile. So, you know, you kind of have to pick and choose the ones that you think your customers are going to enjoy. And what I love about the Sable Blanc is that it's so, it, it gives you a lot of that Sauvignon Blanc type of flavor. It's got a lot of pineapple and uh, pineapple and lemon and uh, uh, grapefruit flavors. Um, so just a lot of fun, but we're the only people in the valley that have that grape planted and only the second in the state of Oregon. Um, awesome. So, you know, it's an example like that. It's just trying to kind of find some new ways and some new things to be able to approach the marketplace to say, hey, this may be a grape you're completely unfamiliar with, but give it a shot. That's awesome. I always love innovation. and and. You mentioned earlier that you were a small winery. For I was looking at your your website, and and for scale purposes, uh, when, when other one other wineries say that they're small, they're talking about hundreds of cases as opposed <laughs> to tens of thousands of cases. Exactly. According to your website, you only have forty three cases of the Helios. That's it, um, and, and and that's kind of that's not atypical. We don't make a whole lot of anything. Um, you know, just we, we make a total of seven wines uh, and we have a total of 500 cases as our annual year production. So, you know, when, when you were talking about 43 cases, you know, just to kind of give folks an idea. Now, I don't put my whites in barrels like I have behind me, but if I did, that would be less than two barrels of wine. Wow. So there's not a lot that we do. Um, and we try to, you know, spread it out to give people, like I say, some options. But, you know, we I probably the one that we're close to making the most of is the rosé at a little over 100 cases. But, you know, that's kind of it. We, we don't, you know, we, we're not trying to sell to, you know, everybody under the sun. We're trying to find the right people and customers for us. That's well, actually, awesome. I know you're probably getting bombarded. So what are your uh, plans for expanding or making more wine to focus on, say, a rosé or something? You, uh, are you capable of doing that? We're capable of going up to about a thousand cases, so about double where we are now. But our, our thing is, you know, what we don't want to give up is the personal styles that we have and the way we do business. I mean, when people come to do a tasting with us, it's a very different experience than you're going to get in many places because you're going to be the only ones here in the tasting room. You're going to have, there's 99% chance that I'm going to be running the tasting. So you get to ask me any questions that you want to ask and you don't need to feel like, be afraid to ask. I mean, we all start from somewhere and we all, you know, it depends on our, you know, how much we want to learn. Some people, it's just great. They just want to enjoy it. And that's awesome. Some people want to get geeky about it. That's awesome too. I mean, we'll take kind of whatever your approach is, but our thing is we don't want to give that up. 
And so we studied quite a bit before we got started in this to try to figure out where is that spot where you ha you can produce a certain amount and then you can keep the, the you can kind of keep the operation the type of operation we have. And where we figured that was about a thousand cases. So a thousand, if we get to that point, cut off. I mean, we're not making more than that. So you know, hey, if, if we should be so lucky as to sell all of the thousand cases in, in a big hurry, you know what, we'll go to Hawaii for a couple of weeks and call it a job well done. I mean, there's just no need to start making more and more out there. And you don't sell, you don't sell in any restaurants or anything in the immediate area, is that correct? Oh, no, I mean, I'll tell you, we, we've, been, we've done in certain situations where we've had the owner or the chef or the GM come to us and say, hey, we, we'd like to carry you. Um, and in a situation like that, we'd be interested in doing it. But, you know, what we've seen just sort of in our own experience is, you know, we, we, all, we go to a restaurant, we look at a wine list and we see hundreds of names on this wine list. We would just be another name amongst many on a list. And because we're so small, we're not going to have the brand recognition that the bigger places are going to. And people, when they are presented with a huge number of selections, are almost certainly going to go with a brand that they've at least heard of. Um, so chances are, even if we were brought in, we're going to sit on that list for a long, long time and the line isn't going to go anywhere. So unless you've got somebody who knows you, who can really push you, that situation can work out great, but there aren't very many of those, you know. So we, we you know, those situations are very, very rare and, and not something that's ever going to be a big part of our business. Well, you've got some fans that were coming to San Diego. Uh, I was posted something on a San Diego Pacific Coast and Beach uh, group page on Facebook yesterday, and a girl uh, started corresponding with me, and it turns out she's moving from Portland. And I told her we're doing this wine tasting with you today, and she's like, oh my gosh, I love that winery. Their wines are fantastic. She got all oh, like, yes. oh, I hope she's watching. <laughs> uh, but, but well, she's good. I hope, I hope she calls me. I, I, I love to know who it was. <laughs> But she was just thrilled. She said, that why? She said, you mean Dave? Oh, yeah, that guy's great. He's come down there, met you personally, loved your wine. And I'm not quite sure how she found you. But, uh, you know, that's a testament to what you are saying earlier about the personal treatment, uh, you know, knowing your customers and give them a great experience. They get so enthusiastic when, uh, when they hear your name. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you still, does your wine sell at stores? And what stores do they sell? No, everything we do is just direct to consumer. Okay. Um, but but as we said, you know, we have the uh, unless you live in Kentucky, well, at least at the moment, or Utah, getting wines shipped directly to you are, are no problem at all. Um, okay, it's just cool. sort of a question of cost. So, so we you, can you, go you're not making a four percent alcohol wine for Utah. <laughs> Oh, uh, Utah. Utah's going to be Utah. Like what can I say? Still today. But yeah, so if you, it, so anybody that's interested in ordering, um, and in fact, this is kind of a, a good way to kind of further to talk about how we do things very personally. If you go to our website, you're going to find we don't have an online order form. And we do that very specifically because we want to be able to have some conversation with everybody who wants to buy wine from us. So call us, email us. And that way you're going to either talk to me or to my wife, Sarah, and we're going to get you taken care of. Um, but we just see the point and click as just being too personal, it, excuse me, impersonal, and it doesn't really help to establish any sort of relationships with the customer. I mean, you'll make a one-off sale, but is that really going to mean anything in the long run? You know, and for a small place that's so focused on trying to build brand and customer loyalty, you know, we'll, we're willing to take those extra steps and invest more of our time because we think it's worth it for our customers. And I love the fact that your wine club, uh, also there's no annual fee to join, because mm -hmm. I think that, that you know, it, when I first started looking at wine clubs, it was daunting. So I didn't want to commit to, you know, to buying, you know, a case a year or whatever. So yours, it's, it's no cost to join. And, and I love the fact that it's the fanfare club keeping in, in the mm -hmm. brand. Uh, but so how does, how does that work? So it's a 10% discount on on a six six bottle annual purchase, but then it kind of goes up from there. and. What are the benefits sure. So, so you, you're exactly you're exactly right. I mean, one of the things that always drove us nuts about wine clubs. Well, I mean, there were a couple of things. One is they always made you buy way too much wine. They never let you pick the wines you wanted, and then they would dock your credit card to from anywhere between two to four times a year. To, you know, regardless of whether you were ready to receive wine or not. 
And so we always said, okay, if we're going to have our own place, we're going to kind of take all those rules off and make things very, very um, customizable and very, very user friendly. So as you saw, your minimum commitment with us would be one purchase a year of at least six bottles. You choose the six and you choose when you get it. I mean, that is your absolute baseline commitment. Now, if so, you choose so there's to no, buy more, there's no quarterly, so it's not, it's nope. not a, hey, this quarter's wine selection. Okay. No, nope, we've got January 1 to December 31, and as long as you get an order in by December 31, you're good. I, I literally have people that email me on December 31st. In fact, it's now <laughs> become kind of an annual tradition for some of these folks. And yeah. so I, I tell, especially my good buddy Chip up in Wisconsin, I, I now tell him, it's like, you know, it's it's not the end of true end of the year until I've heard from you, Chip, for your 1231 <laughs> order. Um, but we, like I say, we have a lot of fun with it, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's that simple. And you're right. It's, you know, our normal shipping windows are in the spring and in the fall. And what we do is when the shipping windows open, we send out an email to everybody that's on our list and basically says, okay, um, we're gonna, we're about to start shipping. If here's what we have available, if you want something, you call or email me, let me know, and I send it to you. And if not, we'll check in with you next time. And that's pretty much it. That sounds great. Well, this Pinot Noir is sitting in front of me, and I just... <laughs> You're cheating. It, 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 it's, it's calling to me. I, I, I try not to cheat. I like to go in order. I like to, you know, follow the uh, the process, if you will. But... Uh, uh, if if we keep talking, I am going to break that rule. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about this Pinot Noir. Yeah, so what we have uh, in front of us right now, this is our Titan Pinot Noir. And good opportunity for me to kind of take a step back and talk a little bit about the vineyard that we have on site. Because when the piece of property that we bought um, and started our vineyard on, it didn't have a vineyard when we started. It was covered in dead Christmas trees and massive blackberry branches. So our vineyard is not old. I mean, the, the oldest vines that we have are just now entering their seventh year. Um, so the fruit that we're using, uh, that we used in the rosé is from our vineyard. The fruit that we are currently using in our fuller body Pinot Noirs are not yet, but they will. At the moment, what you're going to have in this one is a blend of two very, very small vineyards that we've been buying our Pinot fruit from. They're both within 15 minutes of our location. Um, and what's really important about them is that the people that we work with on the growing side, they are not big corporate owned vineyards. I don't work with folks like that. I work with people like us. I want people that live on the properties they farm, have small acreage, and most importantly, I want people that drive their own tractors. Um, it sounds kind of silly sometimes, but you know what happens is people, a lot of people want to come out into wine country, buy a piece of property, live the dream, and then just write a bunch of checks. And you know, for us, we have to be so quality focused because we're so small. I want people that have that same personal level of commitment to what they're doing in their own vineyards that we have at ours and that what we do in here. Um, so I, like I said, I want folks that are in touch and know their vines intimately, and that's how we consistently are able to get that quality year in, year out. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. So I'm going to let you all talk about this one. You, you tell me what you're tasting. I'll tell you what, I don't have zero, like Gabby was saying before, just the smoothness of it has zero uh, that... Almost that city, some city, wine, yeah, like the way down, you know, just, just like boom, straight down. It is smooth. Thank you. It, it goes down really, really easy. Too, too well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no such thing. <laughs> I'm like, this is gonna be gone in a second. As long as, you, as, long as you don't bring 100 cases over the year, then we're okay. <laughs> yeah, this this is very, very good. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very good. good. Well, thank you. I. The, the way what we've always loved about Oregon Pinots is and, and um, you know, I think Gabby would actually were talking about it a little earlier were the elegance of them. They're not big and heavy. They've got lots of flavor, but there's this balance. And, you know, there are really three things that kind of go into this. There's acidity that we've talked about. There's the tannin structure. And for, for big red wines like Cabernet, um, they're grown in hotter climates. Those have a lot more tannin structure to them than Pinot does. 
Um, and then you've got this flavor that kind of overarches. And the way I try to make wines is to say, okay, we've got acidity, we've got some tannin, those things are kind of the bases. And then over top of that, the flavor that you're tasting should be the thing that kind of comes out at you. And that really helps that balance idea. Nothing jumps out at you. Um, I think in a really well-made wine, there should just kind of be this flow that goes on that you kind of almost don't even notice unless you actively think about it. It should just sort of roll across your tongue. And, you know, like I say, you can you can sit there and try to analyze it if you want. But if it just tastes like, hey, this is really good and nothing is like screaming at me, then you know you've got this balance and just a well-made wine overall. Now, one of the things that, that well, first of all, that the, the tannins at one point scared me away from red wines. I was very much of a uh, of a white wine kind of guy. I love the fact that it has it has almost no tannins whatsoever, as far as I can tell. It's, it's a little bit drier than I normally prefer, but um, it's perfect for the, uh, for the for the for what it is. Um, but one of the things I think is, is interesting is is that people say red wine paired with steak, but that's not necessarily not every steak needs to pair with every kind of wine. So. With high tannins, I like to pair with like a ribeye or that kind of, or something that's nice and fatty. What would you pair with uh, with a Pinot Noir? You know, there's there's a, an old tried and true when you're talking about Pacific Northwest Pinots, and you'll hear Pinot with salmon. And sometimes it can get kind of old to talk about that because you hear it so often, but there's a reason for it. I mean, salmon is a thicker fish that has some meatiness to it, but not too much. And Pinot Noir is a red wine that has some of those tannins in it, but not a ton of it. Um, you know, the tannins that you taste in red wines, they all come from the skins of the grapes. And so if you have a wine with thick skins, Cabernet, Merlot, Syrah, the traditional big reds, you're going to get a bigger tannin red wine. Pinot has very thin skin, so you don't have as much room to have the tannins there, and so you'll have lesser tannins in the wine. So you're kind of looking for something that is a step down from beef. But, you know, Pinots these days are pretty versatile, and there is really no reason that you couldn't do it with steak. But it would depend on how it's seasoned and kind of what else is with it. But, you know, I, I, would, say a, I would say a filet a little bit, a little bit yeah. leaner. Yeah, would, would I guess perfect. Fair. But to, some Dungeness crab would be, would be delicious with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Yeah. I know that um, the soil is different over there, and I wanted to know. You guys use like Will the Willa Kenzie soil and something else, but that doesn't does that affect the taste of the grapes as well? Absolutely, and you know we're we're in an area here in the valley where there is a whole. I mean, you could teach university level courses on the geology of, of the Willamette Valley. You have some main types, and believe me, this is an area where we can get really, really geeky. But I'm I'm not going quite there. No, I like so, geeky. I, I hear you. So we have where where our winery sits on is a volcanic clay loam called Jory soil. Um, you know, we have a lot of historic volcanoes up in the Pacific Northwest, and so we, there are these areas where we have the soils that are primarily resulting from the breakdown of those volcanic rocks, and that's what we sit on. Um, now, if you go a little bit west of us, um, you get onto, and Gabby, you mentioned the Willikensee type soils, and that's one of the most common ones you'll find. And that's one of a type of soils that resulted from marine sediment deposits. So if you go way back to the old, to, to the ice age, um, there used to be a huge old ice dam up near where Missoula, Montana is that broke millions of years ago and sent all sorts of amounts of water down and flooded where we're currently at now. Um, and that's what's called the Missoula floods. Well, that ended up over the years having a marine sediment uh, deposits at the bottom. And then there are other types of soils called loess soils, the L-O-E-S-S, -S, I think. And that's just kind of more the breakdown of some mountainous, uh, the, the kind of the tops of mountains into kind of more rocky soils. They're all a little different. Um, they all have different types of mineral uh, components in it that affects the flavor and character of the wines. But the biggest thing that is affected by it is how do they do holding water? because that's gonna determine really whether we have a smooth and silky wine or a more intense wine. And just to kind of give you a sense, the types of wine, the types of soil that we're on, the jewelry soils, the clay loam holds the water very well. So the grapes tend to be a little bit bigger, 
and just it becomes kind of a math equation where okay I've got you know I've got a little bit of gray I've got a little bit of skin but I have a lot of juice so they're going to be smoother not as big of a tannin structure if you go out west to the Willakenzie soils the water kind of likes to trickle through all those marine sediments out there so you're going to get a little bit more of that struggle for the water from the part of the vine and so you're going to get smaller berries and a little bit more intensity and what's kind of cool is that depending on where you are, you can get wines that are purely made on one type of soil. And then you've got wines that are blends of multiple soil types. And what you have here, the Titan, is made up of multiple soil types. So it's just kind of a nice way to show the balance of the area as a whole. And then, you know, you can get other wines that break it down by, you know, on specific soil types or, or what have you. Did you already know all that? You learn it on the fly. Oh, heck no. I, <laughs> it's part of the learning experience, you know? It's, it's, part of, it's part of what makes this so special. I think you can definitely taste the difference, like, with the soil and the grapes and stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, I feel like that's why it's just like kind of smooth and like less acidic and less tannins. And I don't know. It's just so easy to drink this. Mm -hmm. It is. It's yeah. probably one of the smoothest ones I've ever had, actually. And now for, for those of you guys who are watching at home, I, one of the things I think is a great experiment if you have the opportunity is to get three different Pinot Noirs, for instance, from different AVAs and uh, uh, compare the differences, looking at the fact that they're the same grape, especially if you can get it from the same, the same vintner. Uh, but like, you know, last year I had a, uh, I, can't remember, I can't remember the, the vineyard that sent it to me, but I had a, um, a uh, Sonoma a uh, somewhere in northern california and then also a uh, santa barbara pinot noir three very very different areas and it was very interesting to see the difference in the, uh, the how the soil and the climate can impact both the, the tannins the sweetness the fruitiness of it uh so if you if you like a pinot noir it's not necessarily the pinot noir is a pinot noir is a pinot noir but it, it's another level of uh, being able to explore and try new things i i wholeheartedly endorse uh exploring and traveling and trying new things that's a great idea actually. yeah i mean now that you just explained it like that i'm like now i'm very curious <laughs> <laughs> and, and another another great example uh, not just pinot noir but if you compare some of the uh the cabs from like uh uh columbia river uh, valley area up in washington state where it's super super hot but it also gets kind of cold in, in at night to say a cab from uh, temecula valley for instance uh, both mm -hmm. are both are great great areas, but you're going to get a radically different expression of uh, from the same grape. Well, that's a nice transition because I see this actually. Uh, your Firebird actually says "Walla Walla," so I was curious uh, maybe if you could explain that. And, uh, yeah, that, that'll make it. Walla <laughs> what a name. So I, I think I think the biggest thing to real and it, it's like you say it's a really good piggyback on what we've just talked about because. You know, Syrah is a grape that here in the valley, we just don't have enough warmth and our growing season is not long enough to consistently ripen a grape like Syrah. And it's the same thing with Cab and it's the same thing with Merlot. So if you want to make a wine like this, where do, what do you do? Well, you're going to have to travel a little bit. And fortunately here in Oregon, we do have some other regions of the state that produce these grapes and produce them very well. Um, where we happen to get this fruit from is the northeastern corner of Oregon. Um, it is a little town called Milton Freewater. It is part of the Walla Walla Valley uh, AVA or American Viticultural Area. And uh, for those of you not familiar, AVAs are just distinctive areas where that have been identified for certain specific characteristics. There's something that's demonstrably special about areas in that geography that give the wines a very unique and distinctive character. Um, most of these areas are kind of contained within one state. Um, but the, the Walla Walla Valley AVA is kind of cool because it cuts through this little bitty corner of Northeastern Oregon, and that's where this particular fruit comes from. And what's, I think, fascinating is you don't have to travel very far within an area to get grapes that have very, very different characteristic, characteristics. So where I get my Syrah from is a vineyard that is actually on the side of a mountain out there. It's up at about 1,150 feet of elevation. And during the day, you're going to get the sun and the heat because it's hot out in eastern Oregon and eastern Washington. 
But at night, because you're on the side of a mountain, there's nowhere for that hot air to get trapped. Everything cools off. And what happens is that really helps with flavor development. And it doesn't make the, the it's not uh, taking out so much uh, of the, from the water from inside the grapes themselves. So there's a big difference between that and the grapes that you tend to see grown down on the valley floor, even a couple hundred feet away from it. It's hot during the day, the heat gets trapped, it stays hot at night. Those wines on the valley floor out there tend to be very intense very bold, a lot of times very earthy, fascinating wines, but you kind of run into this problem sometimes that they're so big that they're kind of food only wines and it doesn't really give you a lot of flexibility on how to use them. And for me, what I wanted to do with this was to make a big red wine that still kind of gave you the opportunity to just sip it if you wanted to. So having that fruit gives me something that's much smoother, even though it's very, very young, it's much smoother, it's much more approachable, and you're not just limited to a big steak. You could do a lot of different things with this. Heck, you can have this with dessert, and it's going to work just fine. Yeah, I, I'm really impressed by this one, because it's, uh, again, to your point, I'm used to Syrahs being, uh, being very, I don't know what the right word is, but strong and, and, and bold. Uh, but also very, very dry, and, and yours is very, I don't know if it's, it's the right word for wine, but very sessionable. Yeah. Well, and, and you're right. I mean, I think when you, you know, when you think about these traditional big red wines, they're hard to drink. I mean, physically, I mean, I'm, I'm not a young person anymore. And look, I mean, you get to that point where you just feel like the enamel is getting sucked off your teeth and... <laughs> You know, they're just, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I kind of want to be able to actually taste my wine and not have it be some sort of a, you know, a physical endurance thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, you can still get lots of big flavor, but calm down on the tannins and just kind of let the flavor talk and approach it that way. So I'm, I'm curious, really this, is, this is for both Gabby and, and for Dave, you know, it, with especially guys who are new to wine and kind of, you know, either show up at your bar or show up at your tasting room and say like, you know, tell me, tell me what I need, need to know. What are some of the questions that uh, that you get most often, and and uh, kind of hurdles that some guys need to overcome that are all in their head? Um, you want to take it first? You go first. I want to. Hear oh, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I I think some of the things James you talked about at the very beginning of the show this this idea that wine had to be that there is a right way to do it. You know, people are asking me, are always like, do I have to swirl the wine? And there are reasons to swirl the wine, but you know, really I always tell people said, you know, just just do the what you're gonna do at home. I mean, don't change your life for the wine. Just just enjoy it. Um, you know, and a lot of it just will come down to things like what are the flavors that I'm tasting? You know, are they actually coming from the grapes themselves or are you, you know, are you adding these other fruits that you know you can taste in the wine and you know we always say no it's just it's just all fermented grape juice at the end of the day and you know it's just it's these chemical compounds that it, that's what makes it all work and it tricks your tongue into thinking it's something other than it is um but you know i i would also tell people don't be afraid to ask these questions when you're starting out i mean you're not, believe me when I tell you, you're not going to look bad. Everybody has to start from someplace. Um, and within probably 10 minutes, you're going to find that you're going to know quite a bit more than you think. Mm -hmm. So what about you, Gabby? What are, what are some of the questions that guys have when they come into, uh, into the bar? And, I, and, and is, your, is your bar the actual, like a regular bar bar or is it a restaurant and bar? Um, well, I work for two different ones. So one, the downstairs is more of like a bar bar, and then upstairs is more like a little more upscale. So I kind of get like the best of both worlds. Um, I, I mean, I think you know, when people go to bars, they love to drink their typical cocktails and beers, and guys get kind of like weird about drinking wine. I mean, like my fiance drinks wine, and all of our best my friends drink wine, and there's nothing wrong with that. I don't know what it is um but i think that maybe they don't know they don't know why well, i think <laughs> your cat just hit me last week she just on my face yesterday. <laughs> she gets really excited about um <laughs> this blog anyways uh yeah so i feel like um 
there aren't a lot of people that really they don't know much about wine and it's nice to be educated and to like ask questions and you know ask them like about like tenons and like all the flavors in wine and what to pair them with i mean i think that's a huge thing i think people miss out on the wine culture a lot and uh and uh people i mean i a lot of guys that come into my restaurant upstairs um they they drink a lot of wine we serve actually mostly wine which is great i mean they know what they're drinking you know what kinds of wine they're drinking you know like the you know the flavors and everything <laughs> And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a nice thing to be educated um, on, and uh, a lot of people kind of miss out on that because we're so used to drinking like their bourbons and tequilas and their beers, and it's nice to kind of drink everything and just kind of explore your taste buds and your <laughs> your drink culture and all your spirits. So, definitely, definitely, definitely not an, an either an either or. Uh, you know, I think tw twice in the last year I've I've had uh, winemakers that I've interviewed. And both times they've also brought local beers. You know, one, one time I was, I was, it was, it was pitched as, you know, join, uh, I think it was Geo, join Geo out in the in the uh, the wine in the vineyard uh, for a wine tasting. I mean, who who would say no to, to an invite like that? Well, he shows up. He shows up with a bucket of beer and and, and two uh, and two bottles of wine, because he because he said after a hard day in the fields, this is what mm -hmm. me and my uh, I can't remember the guys in charge of the crops. This is what this is what we drink, and then we drink some wine afterwards. Um, That's true. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm curious, kind of how uh, you know what what do you drink in uh, you know after a hard day's work? Are you uh, and certainly there's there's no shortage of amazing craft beer in Oregon. Are you a, are you a beer guy as well as a wine guy? Or what? what oh yeah, we, we we have a thing in Oregon, and I, it's probably true everywhere that it takes a lot of good beer to make good wine, and you know especially during harvest. You know, so good. Uh, this is when you're really busting it. Long days. Um, you're out. You're either in the winery or in the vineyard, or both, uh, depending on when you get harvested. Um, but you're exactly right. I mean, I, we've got some amazing brews out here. I, I'm kind of getting a little less into the multiple hopped IPAs. I mean, this is kind of one thing where I think we've kind of hit this tipping point where yeah. we're trying to like jam a little bit too much, I think, into the beer sometimes and not just kind of letting it be nice and tasty beer. Um, but, you know, we've got we've got so many amazing, you know, I'd say not not necessarily small, but kind of medium producers that ha can make enough volume to get things, make it easily available, but at the same time, uh, not be, you know, big and corporate. And it's it's kind of a really cool thing to see in Oregon. Um, you know, the, the 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 kind of harder stuff. You know, the older I get, the less it starts agreeing with me. And especially having a, an eleven year old daughter, you know, I, there you kind of got to be a little careful. So you know, I, I between those two, though, I'll tell you, there there's a lot to go around. Yeah. Well, I've been crying three days you know, when I when I was coming up to Portland for the race. So that's the craft beer capital of America. They had craft beer before anyone outside of Oregon even knew what the word craft beer was or anything. And they have many, many great beers. I, I stumbled in one time in a sports car race at the Oregon Beer Festival right out there mm -hmm. at the park right out there in Portland, which was great. I have to get up the next morning for those early races. But uh, when did wine start to become a kind of a thing of beer? They're, they're so proud of their beer in Portland and Oregon. But now wines are set. Can you you know a little bit about how the transition happened and how the uh, wines are being maybe accepted by some of these craft beer people? Well, I mean, I, I think a lot of it really has to do with sort of the spirit that people in Oregon have always had about what types of operations we have. I mean, we, it's, it's interesting. You know, if you, if you go down to California, you have a lot of big corporate producers. If you go up into Washington, you don't have anywhere near as many, but there are still quite a few big corporate producers. We really don't have but maybe one or two big corporate producers in Oregon, and it's kind of the same thing with the beer. So, I mean, the whole spirit of the state and of the area has always been ground up from the roots, from the dirt, you know, and, and kind of doing it small and personal and just working your tail off at it. And, and I think that there's this camaraderie, uh, certainly between the wine people and the beer people, because we're doing things very, very similar. 
we're just making different products, but we're marketing in a lot of ways very much the same way. And we're trying to kind of hit consumers at an individual level as opposed to a mass market level. So it kind of allows us, I think, a lot of times to speak the same language and have the same conversations. Um, and, you know, I, I think, too, if you talk to plenty of, you know, as you've seen, you talk to beer people, they're wine people, too. You talk to wine people, they're beer people, too. We all like yummy stuff. And it just sort of depends on what we're doing and, and, you know, what we're having for dinner and just kind of all those other things that play into it. But there's room for so much at our at all of our tables and in all of our glasses that, you know, I think it's just it's just two industries that go very, very well together. So, so the camaraderie between the small batch, small the craft is that you think there's a lot of camaraderie between uh, not only the beer makers and wine makers, but the consumers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Oregonians are always, you know, one of the things that we, we love about here out here is that everybody has a very individualistic spirit and, you know, they want to support the smaller producers. Um, and, you know, and, and like I say, that's true whether we're talking about wine, beer, uh, whiskey, distillery, you, you, you name it. Um, you just don't, I mean, it, it, you know, we have, you know, in Oregon, we have Nike is a big corporation. Um, I used to get the key to their bully store when we were out there. There was a party of ours. Yeah. It was actually Bill Knight's personal PR guy. It was probably crazy because Bill Knight didn't want any PR. <laughs> so yeah. it was crazy, but uh, we, we got the key to the Nike store and went up there and was uh, go up with empty suitcases and come back with full suitcases of Nike gear. Um, one girl spent oh. $100. Sure you weren't loaded? <laughs> yeah, and she bought, she bought like three tennis outfits. She's from Texas, uh, actually. She bought three tennis outfits. I said, I don't know you play tennis. I don't, but they're so cheap. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, no, I, I tried to interrupt you, but I had to, I had to throw that in there because I, I did have a Nike connection at one time. No, I, mean, I was just going to. I was just going to say that it's that's kind of how the state is, and and that's sort of how we are. And you know, it's not just Portland. You, there, we've got some great areas. Like if you go down to Bend in the center of the state, you know, it's high desert, really, really gorgeous. A lot, a huge beer industry down there too. Yeah, so you have to shoot uh, you know, the shoots. It's all over. Sun River and all that. Yep. And, and even it. and even though they are now owned by the devil, so I'm told. Really? Uh, ten, ten Barrel uh, is one of my absolute favorite breweries, just because yeah. they, uh, they they are still innovating, even though they're part of uh, AB. And mm -hmm. uh, they they had some huge balls, though. To be completely, completely honest, too. <laughs> To be bought out by the largest beer company in the world, and then open breweries in places like San Diego and Denver, and I think they opened one in Seattle too. Like that—that mm -hmm. that takes that takes balls to say like, "Hey, you know, we're AB. We're going to pretend to be you know some independent local still uh, brewery." But you know what? If you if you can get over that, they are still the same bend that the, or the same brewery that they were in Bend, and they've got some great great product. Well, actually, AB contributes back to a friend of mine, craft association, which. Distributes longboard or a cool beer. Uh, that's omission, which is the gluten free beer. And uh, I'm sorry, Dan, I'm uh, kind of flaking on the other, but they have, they have three brands. One's a oh, Widmere. They have Widmere out there. Mm -hmm. That's Seattle. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it's a great area. And uh, they've, uh, people, how far are you from Portland? I'm just thinking about logistics, they drive, or where would people stay to go visit your winery and some other areas in the area? Yeah, if you wanted to stay up in Portland, um, it's roughly about 45 minutes of a drive if you're talking about downtown Portland. But to be honest with you, I think the best places to stay are right down here in the valley. I mean, if you want to spend a day in Portland, awesome, drive up and do it. But you're going to get so much more, I think, out of being down here in the valley with us. Um, because, like as I said, nothing is far away. You know, the beach, the mountains, trails, uh, you name it, you, you've got it. Um, and so we've got all sorts, you know, we've, we've got bed and breakfasts, we've got uh, luxury hotels, you know, we've got some just kind of smaller places. You know, we don't have any of the big, you know, Marriott's or Hyatt's. That's kind of one thing that I kind of wish at some point that they would get down here as a place that, you know, if you're a business traveler, for example, and you've built up a bunch of points, you could spend your points on the hotel room. Um, but, you know, the nice thing is that, you, you know, you can come out here and you can, you know, there's stuff for you. You can do spa things. You can, I mean, you've got, you've got great restaurants, um, great wineries, great breweries, 
And it's sort of almost what do you want to do? I mean, we, we say we have an embarrassment of riches out here sometimes just because you've got so much available to you and it's all pretty much here. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, even in the winter, you know, and, and when we moved out here from Ohio, people would tell us how much, oh, you're going to hate the Pacific Northwestern winters. And well, I kind of scratched my head and I said, remind me again, what is it about the Midwestern winters I'm supposed to be missing again? But I mean, it's 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 temperate. It's it's going to be gray and rain on you, but you're still going to be able to do things. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Free coat and umbrella. We, we say there, there's no, there are no bad, there's no bad weather here. It's you just bad clothes. So, so you're a uh, Eugene, right? Parents want to go in and see, their, see the ducks on a weekend, and they could actually stay and and do some wine tasting on Friday or something. Because uh, you're right, you're, you're Eugene, right? If you're that close to Portland, then you must be right next to Eugene. Oh, exactly. I mean, it's it's one of just the, like say the gorgeous things about being here is you're just not far from anything that you want to do. So if I were flying to Portland, uh, how far of a, a travel, like how far away are you from like the airport, Portland airport? From the airport, it would probably be about an hour. Now, of course, I say that because traffic. Uh, of course. Yeah. I don't want you to give me that traffic included. You know, yeah, like, Portland. Uh, uh, yeah, California, yeah. So, we could be eight miles, and it's like forty-five minutes. So I'd rather you just. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so y'all, y'all know our pain. Yes. <laughs> for, for those of you guys who are, who are wondering exactly where it is, so here's Portland right here. And I apologize. It just it popped up uh, when your competitors on there. I apologize for, <gasps> uh, for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, so you can see it's kind of you got the you got the the uh, Sierras right there, and the desert right there, and they're kind of in the valley, right there with the uh, ocean right here. So, mm -hmm. you definitely can uh, do a lot of stuff there. But I think that would be an awesome, uh, an awesome trip to do. Uh, kind of whoop whoop. I was like whoop! I was like zooming in on your face. <laughs> <laughs> nobody wanted. Nobody wants to look at that. At the <laughs> Problem with I, I have a desk full of wine bottles right now, plus my mic stand in front of me. Um, I, can't, I know, I, can't, uh, I heard it pouring. What are you pouring? Lucky one, I'll just up all your I think your wine has hit us. And, and welcome to the second hour, folks, where we're all lit. <laughs> <laughs> Always a fun but no, this time. Is the, this has been really fascinating. I, you know, I we say this every episode. I, I swear it's it's become now kind of our trademark. But we're gonna have to do a road trip up there too, because uh, uh, you know I would love that. Everyone talked about Portland, and, and I had a great time in Portland. Portland, the the food truck pods uh, are. I I hope that they're able to sur to survive and and to thrive in uh, in a post pandemic world. But I guess a lot of independent businesses sadly won't. But uh, Portland's got a great a great scene in general, but if you if you only look at Oregon as Portland, you're missing out on on literally the rest of the state. So, well, Portland can't is wait. An hour five from Los Angeles, so it's really quick. It's a quick, easy, direct flight. I used to take Delta. I believe it's sorry. I think, believe I left at nine. It was there by like eleven thirty. Uh, and so it's an easy flight from L.A. It's easy to get to Portland, and then from there, uh, you know that I five that shoots up and down the state. It's easy to get to places. And uh, if you're staying in Portland, you have to have a, uh, a rail line that goes from Europe to downtown now, which is like really convenient. I actually got a speeding ticket coming back to the airport to Portland once. You! I got, a speeding, I got one because it's in the forest yeah, yeah. airport. Uh, you know, watch your speed limit at 35 or whatever. In the area. They're not like now, California. Now, right? now, speaking, of, speaking of flying, Dave, so I, I know when I've flown to Kennewick and I've flown to some. Um, to Santa Rosa on, on Alaska, wine wine flies free. So for those of you guys who don't know, Alaskan Airlines is probably the best airline out there. To be, con I mean, I'm, I I I know that some I, I know some of us prefer United, and I know some of us prefer American Airlines. Um, <laughs> but the fact that I can take a case of wine home free on Alaska is a huge huge benefit to fly in the Northeast or Northwest rather. Does that work out of Portland too, or is that uh, is is that okay? Yeah. Can't you just sure. check it with any? Yep. Well, no, you, no, you, you can check it, but if if you take a case, if you were to buy a case of wine from Bell's Up Winery, uh -huh. and you were to check it, that that yeah. case of wine is going to be what, like forty pounds, thirty pounds? 
So it's going to cost you like, like thirty to fifty. Like fragile and stuff, you know. Yeah, but it's going to cost you like thirty to fifty dollars oh. for for a checked bag. So but they'll, you can they'll, they'll ship it for for whatever you know. So you can just ship it. You don't have to send it well, on you, the airline. You, you could, but if you do a case, like that's. <laughs> it's it's a little bit. But see, but see James, this is. This is where you plan ahead, and when you come, you bring one of those little carts so that when you get the box, you can just put the box on the little cart with wheels and then just roll that through the airport, check it through, and then you're all good. And, and, and for some of us who have status on American Airlines, it's not a big deal to check two bags. But for the, for the rest of you guys, uh, being able to save you know, 25 to $50 okay. on, on a case... <laughs> Uh, is is yeah. a huge benefit, and I, and I love the fact that Alaskan Airlines lets you uh, fly the wine for free. Well, they they so you don't have to work for United, so she's she's gonna sign up for her her, her airline. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, and and, and I and I, within, <laughs> and, and I'm I'm privileged to be uh, you know status on American Airlines, so I I, I enjoy my uh, you know my two free check bags, but I also understand that. The rest of the world doesn't have those privileges, and you know, saving twenty five bucks or saving fifty bucks, whatever it is, is saving fifty bucks. I mean, hell, that's another bottle of wine. So, mm, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, they've done a great job, and and pretty pretty much any place around here that you go, you know, if you tell them what you're doing, you know, they'll give you the box and they'll give you the little pulp inserts and everything. You just, it's sort of like we pack them up just as if we were shipping them to you, but uh, in this case, we just tape it up and you put your name on it and carry it around and there you go and check it through like we've been talking and it's pretty darn easy. They they make it very, very easy and they, they've been a great partner to have over the years. And yeah, flying them has always, I found, even even if you took the wine out of the equation, I, I love flying Alaska anyway. They, they've just been <laughs> great. So ballpark I, I, estimate, if you were to ship some wine to California, how much is that in shipping? Just like say three bottles or what it, send, what it ever cost to send us? Yeah, so so I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's zip code dependent, so it's a little I'll different if fair. I'm sending it to northern versus southern. But let's just say three bottles is going to be roughly thirty bucks, roughly. Okay, uh, and, and it goes. What James? What? I think it's worth it. I'm a, just a saying, I would do the math. I would figure it yeah. out if I was. A, a check bag. A checked bag is going to be about 20, 25 bucks or 30 bucks, depending on if it's your first bag or second bag. I think American's second bag is $35. I and would just so, have, it, have it shipped from Bell's. I would. Yeah, I would but that, but that's, right. that's, for three, that's for three bottles, though. Well, so, I know. So if you're, if you're doing a case, which is going to be about 45, 50 pounds, you know, potentially, mm -hmm. um, that's going to be a heavy load, which is going to be, I think, I it's like going to be well, well more than $40. More than that. Well, you're not at that point. You're not going to have to Oh, but wow. if you fl if you're flying United out of Portland, then you just say, "I I know Ashley," and uh, they'll be like, "Oh, Ashley," <laughs> and they'll be like, "Good for you." <laughs> but you still have to pay X amount of dollars. <laughs> because you know, if, if there's one thing that airline people love is people trying to pretend that they're special and pretend that they that they that they could get a special discount. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I talked to Ashley. See, she said it was just fine. <laughs> That's not completely false. But not completely true as well. So, anyhow, on on that note, I think I just kind of killed the conversation there. <laughs> <laughs> but this this has been a this has been a lot of fun. I I, I really appreciate you sending us the wine. I, I am really impressed. Yeah, I, I think. The, thank you so much. In the thank car. you so much. Thank you. Such a nice touch. So nice. Oh. That's 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 what we do. I mean, we like I said before. It all really comes down to making everything very personal, and we know people have a lot of choices in the marketplace, right? They can do a lot of different things. So the fact that people would, you know, A, want to promote us the way y'all have been so kind to do, or purchase from us, you know, we, we really appreciate that, and we just kind of want to show how much we, we do. Well, it was very sweet. I thought that was a nice little yes. so Personalized, I felt it. Yeah, your packages are very personalized, which I really love. Not a lot of people do that. With like handwritten letters and everything. Very sweet. Thank you so much. You can only imagine what it'd be like to do wine tasting. If and I love these too. Online, you know? It tells you all the information in each bottle. Oh yeah, we, we send those things out. That has like way more information than you'll ever need. But you know, some, some people get interested in it. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna open your own vineyard, Ashley. <laughs> I'm just saying it's very, very detailed, and I appreciate it. 
Yeah. But it was very, hey. gave me a lot of information. Well, all, all I can say now, beyond the taste of the wine, Dave, you made two girls smile and happy. <laughs> And uh, you've done stuff and that's a lot of guys too, so <laughs> give me a big thumbs up. <laughs> that's not bad for a day's work. <laughs> and, and you have an awesome wife too, so thank thank yes, you for uh, thank you to her to Sarah for She's responding awesome. to my query. Oh, thank you, Brad. Of course, of course. Sarah's the best. That's why we're married. Um, we're coming up on nineteen years this year. Wow. So, so, so where is she? Is she hiding? I saw I saw her in the background when we uh, were starting but. oh she's 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 in with our daughter i think trying to make sure that she doesn't completely destroy the house okay well that's a, that's a noble <laughs> cause <laughs> yeah little things <laughs> excellent well unless anybody, anybody else has anything else i'm going to kind of wrap this up and uh you know really really had a great time thank you guys for for watching thank you, thank so you dave for, for joining us thank you, thank you. absolutely and uh, thank you you're so welcome to come back anytime i'll probably actually i'd like to follow up with you on a do an article maybe about uh, kind of a, a guy's wine weekend. What are some of the guys' stuff that people could do in the area? And um, we'll kind of go from there. So, uh, Sarah, if you're watching, uh, I'll be contacting you. Otherwise, I'll be contact. Well, should, should, now, now that we're introduced, should I just email you directly or should I, uh, should I contact her? I, I, either, either one's good. She's, she's, she's our marketing person. I mean, so I'll say she's going to probably want to see the, see it first, but then she and I will probably talk together about it and team up like we always do. But not mm -hmm. always never a bad idea to reach out to her on stuff like that. Cool. And Dave, I've got a story, the least story on touchclub.com today, and I'll update it after, uh, after a show a little bit, but I've got a story on your winery about being on the show. So it's the least story on touchclub.com with big photo, which I put and tag you on Instagram as well. So thank I'm, you. I've already got that. I'll, it's something James, I need to do more of, uh, is stories on the uh, guests that we have. Uh, but, uh, I needed a good photo. So well, I, could... I liked you, and I added you on Instagram, so we're good to go. Oh, thank you. Okay. Leon, you yeah. me too. Thank you. We appreciate it. And yeah, you can find us, Bells Off Winery, on Instagram. You know, pretty pretty easy. We're not that hard to find, so, you know, You're call us, email us. <laughs> I don't have to worry about taking a, you know, an acid tonight, because sometimes that red wine gets in, in your stomach. I can I can tell this is not that way at all, not a sitting It's not. It's Really, really easy. Smooth. So really, smooth and really, really. I easy. really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. My pleasure. Have it's been, been a pleasure meeting all of you. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. And, and guys, uh, make sure you tune in. We have another wine tasting tomorrow night at six o'clock. Um, but then uh, next Tuesday at our normal uh, uh, virtual happy hour time, who are we talking with, Kevin? We're talking with Franklin. Is it Franklin, Tennessee? Franklin, Franklin Tennessee, uh, which is outside of Nashville, home of Lonely Planet. We uh, uh, just south of Nashville, uh, three hours or so from my hometown of Knoxville, Tennessee. And I'm thrilled to say that we're going to have on live music uh, members of the Bleaker Street Blues Band. It's a collection of guys who play for almost every major blues artist uh, in the country over the years. And they are mind blowing fantastic. Uh, and uh, they're going to be on the show with unbelievable live music. Franklin, Tennessee. It's out of Nashville and my home state, so we're looking at that. And, and we have, and we have not just one, not just two, but I'm told they're sending three bottles also of uh, from H. Clark Distilling. We got a black and tan, which is a really special yeah. thing. We'll we'll wait until Tuesday to talk more about. Uh, but it is a it's an oatmeal something distilled uh, yeah. from the oatmeal <laughs> ale. And I'm always a big fan of taking beer and making turning it into an even higher proof alcohol. <laughs> uh, but they've also got a gin and a Tennessee bourbon, so that's going to be pretty exciting. And uh, thank you, Jason, for, for joining in. Uh, I hope you've been watching earlier and uh, saw your comment just now, but make sure you tune in tomorrow night as well as next Tuesday. We've got lots of stuff going on. Uh, and Dave, thank you again for joining us. I'm going to hit the end broadcast button right now, but if you want to stick around, we can kind of uh, have a, uh, a post-show uh Chit chat, that would be awesome. So, you bet. Bye, guys. Have a great day, guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you.